meeting of the Fenton Community High School District 100 regular board meeting uh, to order. Uh, Mary, may I have a roll call? Yes. Jowett. Here. Peyton Howell. Figueroa. Here. Rago. Here. Ramirez. Here. Ting Paul Pong. Here. Wiedemann. Here. All right. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, Julia, could you please read, it, read our Fenton mission and belief statement? Yes. Our mission is to cultivate successful, passionate learners through rigor, relevance, and relationships. Our beliefs, successful, passionate learners thrive when we champion innovative teachings and engage learning, school and home collaborate effectively, we provide a safe, secure, and caring environment, we infuse social emotional learning into academics and culture, diversity empowers our learning community, and we prepare students to, to fulfill their civic responsibility. Thank you, Juliet. Um, Mary, do we have any requests for public comment? No, not this evening. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, James, district reports, please. Absolutely. First one's going to be a fun one. It's a video of uh, Governor Pritzker uh, giving a shout out to Fenton, uh, which was an awesome uh, recognition, by the way. Jim? Another way to make college more affordable is to help our students earn college credit before they ever graduate from high school, potentially saving thousands of dollars in tuition down the road. Administrators and teachers across the state are engaged in this work, and it's making a difference at places like Fenton High School, a majority minority high school in Chicago's western suburbs, where most students qualify as low income. A few years ago, a snapshot of an advanced placement classroom at Fenton didn't look much like the actual student body. So Fenton's leadership began expanding their advanced placement program, and they now reach a third of the entire student body. Even more impressively, AP scores have gone up across all racial and ethnic groups. And in March, the college board named Fenton Advanced Placement District of the Year. Fenton provided the opportunity for their students to achieve extraordinary success and to save thousands of dollars on their first year's tuition. We should follow Fenton's lead and make it easier for more students to earn college credit in high school. My budget proposal last year requested $2 million to defray the cost of the AP test fee for low-income students, and you approved it. I'm making a request for FY21 of $2.5 million. It's an innovative and cost-effective way to make college more affordable. That's a great speech. We do get a, a little bit of that money uh, last year. So it was just a great recognition. I know we tweeted it out. We put it on Facebook. Great, great uh, reception from all, all the folks that read it. Uh, uh, forwarded to you folks. Just uh, I really like his light. We, we should take the lead like Fenton, you know. Uh, just fantastic. Uh, real, uh, a real bo uh, morale booster. Next one is the finance facility update. At 5.30 we had a meeting. Both mm -hmm. STR and Crystal Financial presented. STR presented their findings, summarized meeting with staff, and presented a comprehensive summary. The primary challenges include just included space, layout, location, condition, equipment, uh, MEP, which stands for Mechanical, Electrical, and Plumbing Systems, and SDR provided a current and ideal learning environment. Uh, Crystal Financial, Rob Grossi, uh, presented Fenton's financial history, the revenues versus expenses chart, fund balance history, issues that impact Fenton, including inflation, retirements, and legislation, current outstanding debt service. Then he spoke a little bit about the referendum bond information and referendum itself, and tax 
tax rate. We concluded our meeting by next steps. We have a uh, meeting uh, again March, when's the next board meeting? 25th. March 25th, 5.30 to about 6.50. Uh, STR will present three buckets for us uh, in regards to how to fund uh, the capital projects. Next one on the list is five essentials. Great, I got good news and bad news on this one. Good news is done. We got the, yay, it took about two months. We have the uh, critical number of students to participate in the survey. Uh, as you know, the five essential survey is done every year to get feedback from our students, our staff, and community. Uh, staff also participated, and we have enough uh, number or critical mass to get a report. We did not get the parent, okay? We did our due diligence, whether it's a phone blast, Wednesday words, flyers out there, and emails. We were short about 20% was the cutoff, Yovan. We got about 8%. 8%, okay. Wow. Um, we got 12%, we're short 8%. Right. We're short 8%. So we'll, we'll try again, but um, to say that we did not try uh, would be uh, missing the mark. Uh, there was a lot of effort there. Uh, we got to encourage our parents to participate in surveys like those. Hmm. Next item is parent conference Thursday. Please come, board. 115 to 615, we have our parent conference. It will be in the field house, something new and different uh, this year. Uh, we've heard from parents. You'll yep. uh, could attest to this uh, for the last couple of years. Hey, look, it takes time to go from one end of the building to another. It's it's, it's sometimes we miss uh, the schedule, uh, the meetings. Here, it's very it's very central. Uh, all of our staff is is within that area in the field house, and it makes a lot of sense. Our other school districts are doing this. Uh, the last two school districts that I've been uh, that I've uh, uh, worked for uh, did this sort of. Um, Set up. You don't mind, you want to add anything to that? No, that's uh, it's something new. It's a pilot. Um, so the staff has been great with us and helping us figure out how to, to get this done. So it's been great. At 615? I mean, parents One, are getting off. 115 to 615. Yeah, but parents don't get off work until, you know. That's, that's this has been every yeah. every spring, this is what we have. Only till 615. Mm -hmm. Wow. What's the date? Uh, Thursday. 27th. 27th. They even made a superintendent table for me right in front of the field house, just in case <laughs> I got two parent uh, 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 meetings already set up. So, a portrait of a graduate, two and a half years going on this one. Uh, hopefully we will uh, get it all signed and approved by the, the three boards uh, March 11th. There's been a lot of uh, uh, work behind the scenes, a quick summer of the events leading to the tri-district meetings will take place on Wednesday, March 11th. We will have a presentation. Yovan is going to be a part of that. Rick, myself, and um, Sam and Michelle have been working on some of the brochure, some of the wording, uh, and communication to the families. We hope to kick this out to our staff in March, March and April, kick it to our community, uh, all three district communities um, in August. Equity uh, audit historic knowledge. Basically, as you know, we took um, the plunge in regard uh, in regards to an equity audit for our entire school district. That report should come back to us in March. Um, so we will fill you in when that that, that report is completed. Wait, Matt, go ahead. What is that? Equity audit uh, study. But what is well, that? what is it? It's basically um, a study of our systems here. Uh, at Fenton and to really pinpoint what are our strengths and weaknesses in regards to equity um, mm -hmm. or in regards to possibly hiring, uh, student learning, facilities, uh, summer programming. Uh, a, a good example would, would for equity would be our Chromebook, right? Um, we took that challenge about five or six years ago. Hey, look, it, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be equitable? So all students within our boundaries have a computer, have a Chromebook. Because some folks had it and some folks didn't have it. So by purchasing those uh, uh, Chromebooks, it made it more equitable for everyone to participate and gain knowledge through those Chromebooks. Okay. So we're doing that study, and um, we'll see where else what it tells us about our school. This whole thing with the AP, um, um, AP expansion is also a, another step where we took on equity. Why is it only though, those students that take AP classes? And not everybody. So we're looking for studies because some of it you can't see. You know that we're we're used to uh, uh, because that's how school works. Mm -hmm. Well, no. You know what? We're going to have a, a different lens at it, looking at it this time, and it's that's the lens of equity. Okay. Master schedule update. 
Student course requests for the 2021 school year took place in January, and admin are now uh, reviewing to create the master schedule. As you guys know, master schedule is very complicated. Sam, Michelle, Yovan are all over this. Uh, it takes a couple of months to create so that all of our students have the appropriate classes. FOIA, we received two FOIAs. NBC5 requested information on our education technology program as it relates to student learning on school issued devices like Chromebook. And the Illinois Retired Teachers Association through, uh, asked for a FOIA requesting the names and emails of all certified staff, teachers, admin, counselors, et cetera, retiring this school year. And you're required to do that? We are. Yeah. Um, in regards to email, it's school email. And then I believe in, did they say phone number? No, they didn't, mm -hmm. just email. So it will be school email, not personal stuff, email. Um, before we get to our guest speaker here, our, our main attraction, not a guest speaker, uh, <laughs> Michelle Papanikolaou, I just want to go over the other part of the uh, agenda. Next slide. Okay. Just real quick, a shout out to Fenton Student Council, AAR Corporation, Wooddale Foundation, and United Methodist Church for participating on a very successful coat drive. About a thousand coats were given to kids who did not have coats this winter. Uh, why did we do, why weren't they recognized here? They were recognized in District 7. Uh, basically because they had a board meeting before us and it was really a tri-district recognition. So District 7 was there, District 100 was there, Kit was there, I believe, and uh, their daughter's there, <laughs> and District 2 is there. So it was really nice. So we gave thanks to all uh, four organizations. Clint's there with three student council. They did a great, great job. We're planning to do this every year. Next shout out is our state champ there. Uh, four students, Fenton students, Bison. Uh, went to state, uh, representing speech. Uh, Ian Ting Pal Paul from going from left to right. Uh, Maylene, Carissa, and Jesus. As you all know, uh, uh, Maylene is our state champ for oratory. Uh, original oratory. Or original oratory uh, for um, uh, 2020. So if you look in the front of our building, there's two signs. Uh, a recognition for, I forget their names, Joy and... Uh, Monica. Monica. Joy and Monica. Now, uh, Maylene will be there. So, 19, 2019, 2020, there's going to be a sign of state champions. There. There's just going to be bigger signs. That's, yeah, that's right. right. Just get bigger and bigger. Hey, that's bigger a good signs. problem to have. Because Carissa hopefully will be there soon, too. So, that'll be great. Right. Um, so, real quick, Jesus uh, took place in original comedy. Ian and Jesus took a duet, what is it? Uh, humorous duet acting, sixth place. And Carissa Lara in poetry. Uh, she qualified for state. Shout out there. Next slide. Before I get into link crew, I, someone had a question. I think it was you, Patty, in regards to recycling or trying to sell our um, CTE small engines equipment for metal. Yeah. We looked into that, so we did our homework. We looked at the Perkin, Perkins grant guidelines. We cannot profit from grant money purchases. So what all, the only thing that we could do is to recycle it, and that's what we did. Okay, very excited about Link Crew. This will kick off next year. Um, um, it's it's student base. Uh, it's part of our our strategic plan. Uh, Link Crew is a national organization that is implemented in high schools and all over the country. The ultimate purpose of the crew is to help freshmen and new students feel more comfortable with their transition and to help them achieve success in the first year at Fenton. Link Crew will help them succeed academically and socially. Link Crew also seeks to build meaningful relationships and provides leadership opportunities for all students. Two of our teachers will be attending the Boomerang Project this spring, which will prepare them to be Link Crew sponsors. Along with the sponsors, 11th and 12th graders will be an integral part of the Link Crew. Students leading students is the program, and that is the mantra. More and more studies show that if students have a positive experience in their first year in high school, their chances for success increases dramatically their sophomore, junior, and senior year. Juniors and seniors who have been through many challenges in their first two years of high school, and they can share these support and support the freshmen. The transition to high school can sometimes be overwhelming, but with the help of our leaders, we will alleviate some of the hardship and set our freshmen up for success. 
We are very excited to start Linku this school year with the class of 2024. So that's just a, a promo for uh, an upcoming uh, program that uh, we're going to take on for our incoming ninth graders and new students. So part of, if you remember, part of the strategic plan was, hey, look, how could we, how could the matriculation from eighth grade to ninth grade be better? And this is one of the avenues we're taking. Was was there a problem? I mean, weren't the ninth graders integrating well? I and mean, was there something identified that made you want to bring in Link Crew? Or was there... I, I think there, I don't think there, uh, the, the right word is a problem. There was opportunity for uh, uh, improvement, I think, in mm -hmm. regards to that. Plus, we heard it with our strategic plan. Hey, look, from one parent group to some teachers to some staff, some administrators, hey, look, this is something that we need to build on. Mm -hmm. And what's nice about this, there's a whole curriculum to this uh, that's consistent throughout the year. It just doesn't take place in the summer and that's done. Mm -hmm. No, it's throughout mm -hmm. the year. It involves everyone in the school, in particular our juniors and seniors, who will be the mentors for our incoming ninth graders and ninth graders so that they could be success successful throughout their four years here. And so just a do, connection. How do the juniors and seniors, are they are they approached? There's to, an, are they certain kids that are approached or are all juniors and seniors? Approached? Apply, yeah. There's they're all welcome. Yes. Process. Yeah. Sorry, was the application, application oh. process. Application process. Yeah, so they're applying for that. <clears throat> very, very exciting. Um, I know uh, uh, the districts, the two districts I work for, we had this very successful student love it. The culture changes, uh, I believe, in, 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 the, in the setting, uh, socially as well as academically. Okay. Next slide. Okay, without further ado, <laughs> we have Michelle with an update, <laughs> curriculum update. I'll, I'll get up. Clicker. Oh, I hate talking to this mic. Okay, so um, this is the last part of a three-part series that I proposed to all of you earlier in the school year. So thank you for always listening. I really love talking about this, um, the work of our teachers, and teaching and learning is at the heart of what we do. So I really love sharing it with you, and I really thank you for continuing to listen to it. Um, you know, we're on a journey toward personalized learning, and I've talked, I've said those words before, but I don't think I've um, delved in as far as I need to to help really define that. So today I want to talk to you, I'm going to talk to you about where we're aiming, right? Um, we're doing a lot of great things and we've highlighted a lot of great things and there's so many pieces of this work that have to come together to get to this aim. But I, I wanna try and clarify that aim, talk to you about some of the things we are doing and then some of the things we're working on. Um, and then share a little bit about more about the why and talk about some next steps. So one of the most particular topics I'm gonna talk to you today is how um, evidence-based reporting fits in with personalized learning. So that'll be one of the primary topics that I talk to, but I wanna review um, or clarify some of the vision that our teachers are working on right now. And when I say this is where we're aiming, what I mean is there's some teachers doing the work. But there's some teachers not doing the work yet. Um, they're doing elements of it or parts of it, and some are further along than others, and we're okay with that. Um, so when I present this to you, I don't want it to be misinterpreted, oh, this is what's happening. No, this is what we're working on, and this is what we're working towards, okay? So personalized learning, um, depending on if you've read anything about it or heard anything about it, you know, sometimes um, it gets pocketed into these very um, uh, confined definitions. This is the definition we work from. We work from the four, these four pillars. We've talked about Leap Innovations. This is adapted from that. Um, the first pillar of personalized learning for us is that teaching and learning is student-led. Learners are entrusted to take ownership of their learning. So everything we're doing with assessment or teaching or programming, we're trying to build in ownership for students. The second part is student-focused. This is where learners are empowered to holistically understand their needs, their strengths, their interests. That's the passion, right? That's the passion part of our mission. 
They, we need them to know who they are. Sure, we need to know who they are, but more importantly, they need to know who they are. Um, it's a lot of where our SEL fits in. Um, student demonstrated, this is where learners can, can progress at their own pace based on demonstration of mastery. And mastery can be demonstrated in a variety of ways. So we want to ensure that we're not holding anybody back um, if they're ready to move on, and we're accelerating learning for students who need to. And we're giving them more than one way of showing that they understand something. And finally, student connected. This is learning that transcends location in relevant ways. This is connecting with our community. This is connecting with networks outside of our building. It's connecting with families, their own families and it's taking that learning beyond the walls of Fenton. So these are the four pillars we work from when we're trying to develop program, teaching learning, assessment systems, what will always help us lead towards a more student-led approach. Um, they need to take ownership. They're gonna be the owners of their own learning in four, three, two, one years, and we need to help prepare them for that, so. We've talked over the last couple months about career pathways, blended learning, project-based learning, and evidence-based now reporting. And I just wanted to draw some um, parallels between those personalized learning framework elements that I just shared and our mission. So career pathways, that's our rigor and that's our relevance. And that's where students are connected to the world outside of Fenton High School. In blended learning, this is about relationships and rigor, and this is helping us get to the student-led. They can manage their own way through a class because it's all there, and they don't have to have the teacher in front of them directing every element of their learning. That happens in blended. We also see in blended that they have stronger relationships with teachers because teachers have more one-to-one -one time because they don't have 25 students to 30 students sitting in front of them all the time. So we see higher levels of relationship. And then project-based learning is about relevance. They get to inquire and investigate things they're interested in. That's a little bit more rigorous in some cases, in most cases, and it's also about being student-focused. So they know who, what their passions are and they get to explore their passions. And then finally, evidence-based reporting. We see this aspect as relationships, because within evidence-based reporting, as I'm going to lay out for you, there's a lot more opportunity for teacher-student dialogue and feedback than in a traditional system of grading and assessment. So I'll take you through that. And we see it as a more rigorous, and I'll take you through that as well. And that's our student demonstrated. That's ensuring that students can demonstrate their learning in a variety of ways, and that we know where they are in their learning progressions. So. You can see some of the actions we've talked about in the very last column. Oh no, sorry. We've talked about like in career pathways, we're doing com computer science. Um, we're connecting right now with Malwarebytes and trying to set up some positive connections with them. We work in students who are pursuing an education pathway. We're starting to partner with our districts too um, and seven, some of our students go out and work in those classrooms. We're doing blended learning in Algebra 1, Geometry, AP Computer Science. We're doing a great deal of project-based learning in English 4, which um, Mike Mitchell and Abra Millman presented to you about, uh, presented to you at one of the board meetings. Foundations of Scientific Research and Criminal Justice. Some of you have gone to the Criminal Justice um, Project ex Exhibition. And finally, evidence-based reporting right now is taking place in English 1, AP Statistics, Aerobics, and a couple of others. So evidence-based reporting. It's, we're finally going to talk about it. I clicked forward. How do I click back? Okay. So I'm going to take you through the why, the what, and the how, and try and help give a broader understanding of what this is. You've probably heard a little bit about it. Um, we have a handful of teachers working on it right now. We expect that another handful will enter the work next year. We're good with where we're at and the size of implementation right now. There's a lot to work out within a system like this. 
you need the right technologies, you need the right digital systems to report and share information with families. And it's really, um, it's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to um, the teaching and learning that we're expected. So there's a lot of understanding that happens under the iceberg that teachers and students have to be able to develop before that reporting is done with any level of fidelity. So we are working out so many elements of what's under the iceberg right now to make sure that what's happening above the iceberg is gonna be really high quality. So with about seven teachers working through this right now, they're doing a great job, but every day they're uncovering like another layer where they're like, okay, um, we can do this better and we can do that better. So when we onboard the next group, we have normed and guidelines and um, suggestions on how to implement this with high levels of fidelity. So we're very satisfied with the group that's working on it right now, what they're finding and what they're preparing for their colleagues moving forward. Um, I'm, I'm gonna show you a video and it, it gets to the heart of this iceberg idea. It, it, it shows you that this isn't just about how do we calculate the grade and how do we land on a letter grade at the end, which by the way, evidence-based reporting does have letter grades. We have to make that clear, right? Like there's a lot of misconceptions about that. We do have letter grades. We will have GPA. But that is just one small aspect of what's happening in the classroom. We're completely shifting how we look at assessment. So this is gonna give you a little bit, you're gonna hear competency-based education that's being um, used interchangeably with proficiency-based systems, personalized learning. Um, so when we developed our curriculum, we developed competencies. So this is the closest um, language match that I could find for what we're doing. As people are willing to buy more, they're making more and they're charging more for it. How does that relate back to our free market principles? As demand goes up, supply goes up. Because we assess student mastery of competencies, we have a better understanding of exactly what the student can do. It's a more equitable system for assessing student understanding. And it also puts the ownership of the learning into the kids' hands. You're being assessed on competency number three, presentation of learning. Competency-based learning is the idea that students are trying to meet certain big picture understandings, not complete a bunch of tasks, jump through a bunch of hoops, and average a bunch of scores out. I want to make sure that you guys are aware of the competency. The competencies are anywhere between five to seven statements that say that these are the focus areas for this course. This is what you need to demonstrate that you know to have mastered this course. The most fundamental shift an individual teacher can make is to just take those traditional categories you used to have in your gradebook, quizzes, tests, homework, and shift them to the enduring skill sets and habits of mind for your discipline. We're going to have like two of each. And the kids, because that's how they're being assessed, start to think about things a little bit more in terms of the enduring understandings you're trying to get at. Good morning. I'd like you to start working on your project today. It goes with competency two. It is over here on the walls. I think the competency-based approach is better because it gives students the ability to demonstrate competence in a variety of ways. In the economics class, the competency that we are demonstrating is supply and demand systems. So they charge $100, $200, $300, up to $600 for it because it's fairly cheap to make them. We have individual freedom when it comes to the work that we can do. We can do a test or we could do a project, either like a PowerPoint or a poster. So you're still set on this SpongeBob idea? Yeah. I had two students who have been hounding me about a SpongeBob episode. He has to buy the chocolate bars and has to buy bags to carry the chocolate bars. Is that part of the episode? Yes. Okay. The whole episode really talks about how there's different ways of selling things. There's different styles of how you sell them. So your product that you're going to focus on are the chocolate bars. They believe that selling chocolate bars demonstrates the concepts of demand and supply very well. Consumer tastes and preferences definitely demonstrate right. So I challenge them to create a series of graphs 
and then analyzed each graph and looked at that interplay of demand and supply and the prices. What could you look at? Preferences. Okay. And then, like, the number of sellers. I'm not a very good test taker, but with the project, we're able to say, this is what I need to do, and this is what I need to work on, rather than just trying to cram it all into our minds. So it sounds like you've got two ideas, but we need to come up with two more. Okay. Choice allows them the opportunity to be cognizant of their learning style and how they learn best. We'll continue with this tomorrow. Have a good day. Ladies and gentlemen, when you start to think of your procedure from the lab, remember you are in charge today. Since this is completely our decision, how we do it, we have to write our materials, procedures, all that stuff that we did. The whole idea of competency-based, it puts ownership in the students' hands to demonstrate that they were able to master that particular competency. As close as you can. You can have one area of the room on something that other students have already finished. Sitters right here. Sometimes you'll have in a different corner students going back to revisit something. Which one's this? Sugar, sugar, and then this is NACL. They have to meet each competency. Procedure one was get get the chunks of the anything. So they could do a really good job with the concept, but not do a really good job with their science process. They don't redo that assignment. But in the next lab that we do, maybe that student does a formal lab report. Yeah or they could take a written test instead. They could do an essay on something. You don't just move on with a big gap in your understanding. We don't let you do that. Because you're assessing the student in a way that fits the student. Excellent, good job. You're getting a better assessment of where the kid really is. You have your price and then you have like the supply. Competency-based education is just, in general, much more fair for every student. Ready, go. So that's a glance of what it looks like at one particular high school. There's variations of what this looks like. There's the Fenton way that we will get to. Um, but those essential components are there. What you heard over and over was mastery of competencies, true mastery, not just moving students along without major gaps in understanding, right? So that is the essential theme here. Um, and what we need to think about is why are we doing this? Like, why not just the old way? Why not the traditional way? We really believe that this is going to better prepare students for college and career. When you put students in a position to take ownership of their learning, you're giving them the practice to be owners of their learning in the future. In our careers, in our colleges, they do not self-direct or they do not teacher direct or boss direct everything people are doing. Bosses don't want students who rely on direction every step of the way. When they go to college, they spend more time out of the classroom directing their learning than they do in the classroom. So although this needs to be scaffolded from a freshman year to a senior year approach, and we understand that, we also understand that if we don't expose them and give the opportunities to grow these kinds of skills like independent learning, self-efficacy, self-management, resiliency, and self-reflection, we're disservicing them. So we really want our assessment systems to allow for these to be practiced. And that's what an evidence-based assessment system does. It puts assessment into the hands of the students and relies on them to show evidence of their learning and build these kinds of skills. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of how that happens. Um, let me say, how does evidence-based reporting help create college and career readiness better than a traditional or other grading systems? So let's compare. Traditional way, teacher does all or most of the assessing. Student hands something in, teacher assesses it, gives it back with a mark, right? So that's like the teacher role versus the student role. In an evidence-based system, students are empowered to assess themselves and come to understand themselves as learners. There's a higher level of reflection. They're assessing themselves. They're tracking their competencies and how well they're mastering their competencies. Traditional way, evidence-based way, the types of assessments. 
In a traditional way, teacher provides an assessment or a test. Um, many times it's about the acquisition of the knowledge because it might be in a test format. You really can't get to really higher levels of thinking when you're in a test format or the application of a skill. We're taking them beyond that and we're actually asking them to perform in authentic ways to show evidence of more rigorous competencies. So these are things that can't be easily transponded on a paper. Sometimes you just need to see it in its totality and they're performing. Because when they get out into the real world, they're gonna perform. They're not gonna write it down and say this is what I would do if I had to do it. So we're actually giving them the opportunities to do that. Lastly, um, one of the biggest comparisons is the idea of compliance versus evidence. So in a traditional way, tasks are assigned by teachers. Students earn points for their completion or their compliance. And then we average all those points and define a grade. In an evidence-based approach, teachers serve as a mentor. They guide students through the proving of their mastery. Um, students provide their evidence. Students reflect on the mastery and dialogue more regularly with teachers about feedback. And it really comes down to the evidence of mastery that defines the grade. There's one more comparison, like what does this actually look like in a tangible way? And this is where the rigor comes in. And we're finding that <laughs> this is tough in some cases because we've traditionally pass students on even if they had major gaps in their learning. And we're not willing to do that anymore. So if you look at the first column in an averaging approach, standard one, two, three, four, and five, this student, student number one in our traditional approach, they got a 90% on standard one. They got a 95% on standard two. Maybe that was unit one, unit two. Unit three, they got a C. Unit four and five, they failed. They weren't able to show that they had an understanding. In our system, that's as low as we go now, 50%. That student gets a C. Even if they got a 40 and a 40, they still pass the course. Even if they got a 40 and a 30, I think they still pass the course. So if, even if we didn't have that threshold of a 50%. In an evidence-based system, that student does not move on because they have two main major competencies or two major understandings that they have not even shown an approaching mastery level for. So that student is required to keep working at it until they earn it, until they can earn that credit. That's the biggest difference. We're not gonna move kids on with gaps in their learning. This is hard, because some teachers are like, you know, I want to give them that D. I don't want to punish them. But if you send them on to the next level of coursework with gaps in their learning like that, what are you doing to them? You're going to make it even harder for them. So we have great teachers that are taking a competency approach to say, I'm not just going to fail them. We're going to incomplete. We're going to keep working at it. We're going to work on it over the summer. We're going to work on it into next semester. So we have some systems that are starting to build to make sure that they have every opportunity to continue showing mastery. The other piece of this assessment style is that it allows students to fail. And that's a skill that some of our students don't have, don't feel comfortable with, right? They've learned the system. They collect the points. They collect the coins. They sometimes have an inflated self of perception because they've learned the game of compliance. My teacher tells me to do this. I do it. I turn it in. I get everything in on time. I get my points. I can do this. Life doesn't work that way. So we want to ensure that they can learn through failure. So um, one of our consultants that we work with he talks about the bicycle analogy, and he says, you know, he now, because he understands the psychology of learning and how important it is for us to rethink the way that we teach and learn, he now teaches his kid to ride a bike in a completely different way. He said, there would have been a time, I think, with his first kid, he would tell the student, or tell his kid, okay, these are the pedals, this is what moves it, here's the handlebars, use this to steer. When my mom and dad taught me to ride a bike, this is how it went, and tell the story, and does all this front loading of information. 
And then he says, okay, now go on the bike and go. And um, he holds it for him, and the student rides, and his kid rides the bike. He said, I don't do that anymore. He said, I put my kid on the bike, and I teach him how to fall. That's the first thing I teach him, is how to fall. He said, and then, put him back on the bike, and I let him go further, and I teach him how to fall when he goes further. And my, that student, that child, learns that it's okay to fail, and that he can learn and get better from his failures, and it creates that growth mindset. So it's, it's a small analogy, but it's an important one to think about how we're trying to flip um, our mindset. You know, not just modeling everything and then, and then having them repeat it or regurgitate it, but having them learn through inquiry and failure and um, reflection. So that's the best analogy I've heard so far. So that's the why. That's a little bit of, um, you know, the what. Um, he, here's what we're trying to do to help our stakeholders through this. So how are we helping students with the adjustment? This is an adjustment. They have not learned this way their entire career. They are coming in and they are having a hard time. We're putting more ownership into their hands than they've ever had before. They're not getting any of this in grade school. Um, well, I, I've been articulating with District 2 and 7, and they're working towards it too. But we have longstanding traditions in education um, so there are still some elements where we have to help students gain um, independent learning skills. So um, we're articulating with the Ascender Schools. <laughs> That's one way we're um, working with this. Um, we have a lot of our core teachers and departments talking about a freshman boot camp in core academic areas saying, okay, we're gonna spend the first week or two talking about like, how this type of learning works, why it's important for them, um, how they can manage their learning, give them the tools, give them the resources, help them understand how they can be more independent learners. And then we're beginning more formalized feedback sessions with students. We've had some informal work with students, but we really have to listen to them. Our teachers are actively seeking out feedback, but I, we wanna do that at the administrative level a little bit further. How are we helping families? Um, we have a guide for all the, uh, an EBR guide. We have had EBR parent nights with PTO. Um, I've had a lot of individual meetings with parents <laughs> to work through this. We've had informational tables. I'm gonna have a table at parent-teacher conferences, next open house, I'm gonna put a table out to answer questions. And we're working on some web website information. We're in the process of developing our own little video. And then how are we ensuring teachers are prepared for the adjustment? We spent the last two years developing a highly structured competency-based education. This was a transition for some from a very knowledge-based uh, curriculum to a very skill competency-based transition. Teachers wanted to understand their skills progression and how they take students through skills, so we had to clearly define it's a highly structured curriculum framework, and our teachers have been at the heart of developing it, and they have done a phenomenal job. We just had one framework completed today, and we celebrated, because we're like, whoo, this has been a heavy lift. But that is the foundation of how you put, if you don't have that foundation in, they're just gonna take standards and plop them into the old way you did it, and you're not gonna see any shift in ownership. So we think that that was an important first step. Um, we also have used a very systematic approach to implementation, letting the, there's, we've learned about three types of um, staff members. There's your sailboats, the ones that are like, yep, I'll do this, I'll, I'll speed ahead, I'm, I'm gonna jump into it no matter what. You got your tugboats, they're awesome. They're gonna, as soon as you show me an example, I'll do it. I'm on board, I get it, but I just wanna see it first. Then you got some anchors sometimes, right? We have some sailboats going right now, and we have some tugboats ready to get on board. But we are letting those sailboats pilot, norm, and get ready to scale, and get ready for those um, tugboats who are coming on next. And then we're doing ongoing professional development from experts and from one another. So we're working with a couple of consultants, um, Rose Colby on um, competency-based education, and Tony Reibel um, on evidence-based reporting and we have developed some of our own expertise in-house, so we're really excited about that. So, bottom line, 
what are we seeing so far? Um, we have teachers that are doing this. They're reporting there's more conversations, there's more connectedness, there's more mutual trust, and more confidence, self-worth, and empathy of their students. Where this is going well, these are the results that we're seeing. We're happy about it. It's a, a long-term project. We expect that this will um, be about maybe four years before full implementation, maybe five. We're basing our implementation on readiness of the teachers. We don't want students entering into settings where teachers don't feel ready to do this. Um, so um, we're very, we're very pleased with where we're at with our work, and we're very excited about the opportunity for these kinds of things to benefit our students. Conversations, connectedness, self-efficacy, independent learning skills, all of those very important skills they're gonna need in life. So, any questions? And one um, example you have, with the standards four and five, yeah. you know, where they're the ones, do they just repeat do they just repeat those two items? Oh, yeah. Until they get it, not everything. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have them to take a whole course over. And uh, one of the other differences is sometimes in a traditional method, that one thing might be assessed one time. In an evidence-based system, they naturally get assessed, have the opportunity to show evidence multiple times because of the way that we build our curriculum framework. Um, it's not just a one and done, you got this or you don't, I'm moving on. It's we're gonna circle back around to this and you're gonna have another opportunity to show us. So those kids who got a one, or that kid who got a one, he, he got a one three or four, five times. So, but we would only go back and work on the one. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, what have you found um, in other schools that have done um, this, the independent learning skills in, and then also what, what year, um, what class year, how, how do I want to say it? What have you found um, in your research for schools that do this type of learning um, as far as the students' ACT, SAT scores? Have they stayed the same, increased, decreased, and then for the students that are doing it now, what year will we be able to see either an improvement or a decrease in those scores? So, we just visited um, a school out in Wisconsin, in Wales, Wisconsin, called Kettle Moraine. Um, they're kind of like a leader in this work around competency-based and um, personalized learning. And what's the name of the assessment? That's the world assessment of the OSEP, uh, OECP. Um, it's used to uh, compare countries. They're scoring higher than Japan. Um, so they're scoring higher than most countries, and their SAT and um, SAT scores are well beyond anybody around them. They've actually seen growth um, in their scores over time as they've lended themselves to more and more competency-based opportunities for students. That's in Wisconsin. That's not down the street. Um, our other comparison model is Stevenson High School. They're doing great. Um, their kids, they're at about 95% implementation. They've been working at this for the last seven, eight years. And they historically have had very strong um, SAT and ACT scores, and they continue to. Um, they're not seeing any dips or um, any changes in their performance on those. Um, this doesn't, this actually provides in most cases, more rigorous expectations. Um, in addition to having like all these ancillary benefits of uh, these self-directed and self-reflection skills and all of that, we also have competencies that are more rigorous in nature. It's not like you're learning a piece of knowledge and regurgitating it, that doesn't stick. Like that's not learning that sticks. So they actually have learning that's more in the analysis, synthesis, and creation, levels of the higher order thinking. So yeah, yeah, it takes them into the higher levels of critical thinking. So 
when your brain starts to function at that level, those kinds of tests, um, like SAT is not a knowledge regurgitation test. It's an analysis test. Like how well can you analyze, how well can you um, read and analyze what you're reading or um, problem solve in your, in your um, mathematical skills. Particularly in math, we anticipate to see growth here and we continue to see growth in our scores because we're allowing students in that area more than anywhere else to move forward and not be bound to what the teacher wants to do on that day. Kids who are ready to move forward can move forward and those students who need more assistance are getting more assistance. That was my other question. I'm wondering how are the students in those math class, maybe I'm, I have a hard time just because of how I was taught, how are they learning without the teacher, I mean, Matthew how are they only learned. Forward? Yeah, how are they moving forward? I mean, math is taught. I mean, it's pretty logical. I mean, I don't. I'm. I'm trying to figure out how are they learning it. So our <laughs> teachers are still very much problem. teaching. <laughs> yeah, they're still very much teaching. Students have a choice. We've evolved a little bit um, since the beginning phases of when we started implementing this in math, but. Um, the students have a choice in how they can learn. They can learn on Khan Academy, which gives them examples and um, some. Hmm? Khan Academy. Yeah, they can learn. Um, our teachers have done like screencasts, and they can see the teachers in action teaching the skill, or they can go and have direct instruction from the teacher. So te the students actually get to choose what mode works best for them. So a student who was like, "I need a teacher teaching me." they can still have access to that. And a student that can self-direct their learning and say, after a couple practice problems, I can do this. Um, so they do have access to a variety of modalities in math. Yeah, and they're moving forward. We star test them uh, three times a year to make sure that they're making progress. Um, we, we track their progress, uh, the development of the competencies, and they don't just get assessed on Khan Academy, they have um, assessments, paper assessments, where they do the problem solving on paper. They do those um, at the end of every unit, and for some kids, weekly. So. Michelle, I'm going to take devil's advocate here. Yeah. This is a lot of work yeah. for the teachers, for the administrators, for the students. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's student centered, yeah. right? Why do we want to go that way? Why do we want to do all the work? And why should we be student centered? Well, it's going to prepare them for college and career. That's, that's my why. I mean, when they leave our doors, there's not going to be anybody checking their work every single day saying, you turned it in. Thank you, thank you. Yep, good, good, good. We just talk to our alumni. Sometimes they don't get feedback for long periods of time. And we need them to be able to work against a set of standards and be able to say, okay, I'm getting closer. I'm learning this. Um, and when they get into a career, even more importantly, we want them to be the most successful people in their organizations. We want them to be able to not have to rely on their boss to give them every piece of training along the way. We want them to be the ones that excel and lead and all those pieces. But I don't know if that answers it. I just. Yeah. I just, I just looked at the distinction just on definition between just regular knowledge or skills versus competency. And so um, here's kind of definition, which I think matches where you want to go, mm -hmm. where we should go. Uh, competencies refers to skills or knowledge that lead to superior performance. A competency is more than just knowledge and skills. It involves the ability to meet complex demands by drawing on and mobilizing psychosocial resources, including skills and attitudes in a particular context. Mm -hmm. we, we call it skills, skills knowledge, knowledge, and dispositions. dispositions. And, and we've, we've taken, taken and combined thing. skills, knowledge, and dispositions to develop our competencies, which are so cool. Um, I, I wanted to share some of them, and we just sent them to like to Rose Colby, who kind of wrote the book on it. She's out in New England. Every single New England state does this. There's whole states that do this, not just small school districts in Chicago, right? And she kind of wrote the book on it, and we sent her some of it, and we got some initial feedback, and she said, your English competencies are amazing. So she was even impressed with the work that some of our teachers have done. Um, 
and I, we're, we're putting it in a f digestible format right now as we do complete. Like I said, we completed some today, and our frameworks by the end of this year will be completed, and they'll all be online. So we're putting it in a nice digestible format, so anybody who gets online can say, here are all the competencies a ninth grader would be able to master, 10th grader, 11th grader, and all the subject areas. We rewrote the entire school's curricul curriculum. It was a lot of work. <laughs> The, uh, the testing, the, the mastery skill, uh, is it subjective? I mean, like, do the teachers... Like, it's, it's based off a rubric, um, and, but they're pretty well-defined rubrics. Um, there's one overarching statement that says, okay, you're at a four, a three, a two, or a one. Three being mastery. Um, four being above mastery. So some people think like, okay, four is mastery. No, three is the mastery, four is above. And then underneath that general statement, there are criteria skills. So these are all the things that would go into achieving the mastery on this. So it's very clear. A teacher can go through and be like, you got these parts, but you're still working on this little part down here. Um, so like presentation skills, eye contact, voice, um, knowing your audience, all those pieces. They would be able to break it down with the students during that dialogue and feedback session to say, all right, you, you got this. You made great eye contact, and you, your voice was awesome, but you didn't really know your audience. <laughs> you know, So they could really give more specific feedback where it might be like, you got a B before, and maybe we marked it up and said, yeah, you got an A. But it would, be, it would use rubrics. Mm -hmm. What about the student that goes off to college and has to sit down and take a regular test. So, so there's still so regular tests <laughs> in a lot of cases. And we, we found that. We found, especially in um, undergrad programming, that they still see some tests. Um, but it's still about 50-50. College has changed um, as in CNA programs where they know that they're getting ready for the bars or, or you know the boards, and maybe in law where they're getting ready for the bar even though they use a lot of Socratic. Um, we're finding that um, we're seeing less and less of test taking and more and more of performance assessment in college, but we are still giving paper assessments in a variety of settings, especially our AP settings. That's not gonna go away. Um, and our math still does a lot of paper, pencil, and you'll see it intermittently because their assessments for performance are still gonna be performance based, right? Like their final grades are gonna be based on performance, but all the little things they learn in between, we can test their knowledge on a multiple choice. We can test certain things in that format. So I don't think you'll see it go away completely, but where that grade is determined will be based on performance, not on tests. Any other questions? Um, I'm going to have a table set up, so if you guys want to talk more about it at parent-teacher conferences, come on by, and then um, I think some teachers will try and join me, too. I didn't bother them with it today. You guys have heard a lot from the teachers, but I was trying to keep the time down. Um, if I get them in here and talking about it, they'll be talking all night, just like me. So, uh, practice, real-world, student focus, fair, mastery. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Sorry. 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 Okay, I don't think we have any other items under other. Um, I would move on to the consent agenda. Um, do we have any questions or comments? of any items on the consent agenda? If not, you may have a motion then to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Thank you, Juliet. Second. You have a second. Leo. 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 Second. Leo. Yeah. Thank you, Leo. Uh, roll call, please. Jalowick? Uh, yes. Figueroa? Yes. Rago? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Team Popong? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Okay, the motion has passed. Now we move on to discussion items regarding the uh, adoption of the 2021-2022 uh, 
2021 uh, school calendar. Um, I know we've spoken about this. Is there any more comments or does anyone have any questions regarding the calendar? Do the, um, the uh, early outs, does that, those all add into the, the total number of days? Yes. You have? Yeah. yeah, we need 176. They, okay, so if they're here half a day, does that count as a day? It depends on how many hours. Uh, okay. We do 300 hours. Um, just FYI, uh, how many minutes? How many minutes? Three, I'm sorry, 300, 300, hours. 300 minutes. <laughs> 300 minutes. <laughs> we, we as a school district um, tend to clock in more hours than what's necessary. Minutes. Minutes, minutes, minutes. minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Convert to hours. Overall, which converts hours. To hours. Which converts to hours. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I get that. Okay. Okay. All right. Then may I have a motion that the Board of Education adopt the 2020 20 21 school year calendar as presented. Uh, so moved. Uh, thank you, Patty. You may have a second. Second. Thank you, Jackie. You roll call, please. Figueroa? Yes. Rigo? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Ting Po Pong? Yes. Jalowick? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Now we move on to committee reports. Uh, the no. adoption of rollover. The adoption of the rollover, correct. <laughs> okay, the, uh, uh, this is an item we've discussed already, so may I have a motion that the Board of Education adopt the one-year rollover of the Fenton Education Association FEA contract for the 2021-2022 school year. So moved. Second. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Leo. Roll call, please. Rego? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Ting Po Pong? Yes. Jalowick? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Motion has passed. And now we move on to the committee reports. Uh, Bensonville Community Foundation, Juliet, I can't, I don't believe there was a meeting. Meeting next week. That's next week. No, okay. this week. All right. Um, finance facilities <laughs> committee meeting. We just had our meeting today. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything more to add. Um, ISB delegate, that's myself. There's no nothing new regarding the ASB, except that we have the upcoming March 4th DuPage Divisions Inner Meeting at Marquette uh, School District. Uh, that's on March 4th. What time is that? Old bus is leaving at 545. <laughs> the old bus. The old bus. Reaching the back. PM. PM. It's dinner. No. It's dinner. All right. Uh, Len? Friday. Friday, so that's coming up. Uh, NEDSEC? Next Monday. Next Monday. And that's next Monday also. And the policy committee, Patty and Kid, I don't think we, we have, have not received any new policies. We will let you know from the state. All right. All right, the next uh, board meeting is on March 25th at 5.30 again. For the finance facility. Right, for the uh, facilities finance committee meeting. Um, yeah, at 5.30 again. Uh, all right, if there's nothing else, then we have move into closed session. So uh, may I have a motion and a second to go into closed session for the purpose of collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees, 5 ILCS 120-2, section C2. So moved. I'll second. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, roll call, please. Ramirez? Yes. Team Coco? Yes. Jalowick? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Rago? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. All right. We will be back in open session.